Um, so uh, I wrote a little introduction that um, paraphrases a, 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 a speech from the novel. Um, so sorry about. Sorry if you think it's very corny, but. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being in attendance. Thank you for resisting all inducements, powerful as they must have been, to stay indoors in order that you should come here and listen to Mr. Tom Cruise speak. He will address what I'm sure you'll agree is one of the best debut novels and best novels full stop of the year, the very notable The New Life. Mr. Crew, a contributing editor at our London Review of Books, is a master of all things late Victorian, a most fruitful sir of language, a most avid pursuer of truth, a reaper of the harvest. And it is with great pleasure that without further delay, I recommend him to your attention. Reading from the beginning of The New Life, Mr. Tom Crew. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is that all right? Um, yes, I'm going to start just a few paragraphs into this opening. Um, and if you haven't read the book, all you need to know is um, that John is pressed very close up to a man in the underground. Um, that's probably all you need to know. <laughs> <coughs> He was hard. The man had changed position, or John had. Perhaps it was only a jolt of the train. But someone had changed their position. The man's jacket scratched at John's stomach. He felt it as an itch. And his buttocks brushed against John's crotch once, twice, another time. John was hard. It was far too hot in the train, far too crowded. The man came closer, still just within the realm of accident, his buttocks now pressed against John's crotch. John's erection was cramped flat against his body. The man and he were so close, it was cocooned between them. Surely he could feel it. A high, vanishing feeling travelled up from John's groin, tingling in his fingertips and at his temples. He could not get away, could not turn his head, could only smell the hairs on the back of the man's neck, see the neat line of his collar, the redness on the tops of his ears, could only feel himself hard, harder than before, as though his body were concentrating itself, straining in that one spot. Surely he could feel it. John felt panicked, sweat collected in his armpits. He dreaded the man succeeding in pivoting about, skewering the other passengers with his elbows, shouting something, the carriage turning its eyes, a gap opening around his telltale shame. And yet he knew that he did not want it to stop, that he could not escape the grip of this terrible excitement. The man began to move. At first John was not certain. He thought again that it might be the jolting of the train. He had been willing the hardness away, counting from a hundred in his head, breathing slowly through his teeth, when he felt the slightest movement, as though the man were pushing back against his erection, as though he were gently tilting against it, rising and falling on his toes. John's first sensation was a rush of dread, followed quickly by a rush of something else, that same high, vanishing feeling running through his fingers and up to his temples. He had no control. He was crowded on all sides. He was fixed at the centre of a mass of bodies, his entire consciousness constricted, committed to this small circle of subtle movement. This man's buttocks pressed so tightly against him it almost hurt, moving up and down. A bead of sweat released from his armpit ran quickly and coldly down his side. He tried to look about him at the other passengers but could not. Instead he gazed frantically, surrenderingly at the man's collar, the redness on his ears. Was that a smile creeping to the edge of the moustache? And still it went on, unmistakable now, the rising and falling, the pressure, almost painful, moving up the length of him to the tip and down again. He breathed heavily through his nose, breathed heavily onto the man's neck. 
He wished he could move his arms, that he could move anything at all, that his whole being were not bent so terrifyingly on this sensation, this experience, that he could for a moment place himself outside it. He breathed heavily again, saw how his breath flattened the whitish hairs on the back of the man's neck. His face hurt. He felt a strange pressure under his ears. He swallowed, took another breath, pomade and eau de cologne, cigarette smoke, salt. Up and down, the pressure dragged painfully to the tip, down again. He was sinking under it. He could barely breathe. The train slowed. They were coming to a stop. He gasped onto the man's neck. He longed for escape, for it to be over. Up and down, up and down, pleasure lancing through his body. The light changed. He saw over the man's shoulder the brighter lights of a platform. He tried to step backwards, could not, yet. He heard the doors being opened, heard the aggravated noise of the platform, waited for the pressure to ease, for movement in the carriage, for people to depart. He longed to turn his head. But more people were pouring in, more darkness, black pressure, umbrellas, canes, satchels, dresses, coats. He and the man were forced even closer than before. He could feel the full warmth of the man's body, the climbing curve of his back, the shoulders braced against his, and his lips were nudged onto the man's neck. He felt the hairs on his lips, tasted the pomade and the eau de cologne. The man was still tilting against him. They were moving together now, in a slow, crushed dance, rising and falling in time. The train pushed off. The lights quivered. It was unbearably hot. He felt faint-headed, almost in pain, and then he felt the man's hand, a hand unbuttoning him, felt the slight opening, an access of air, his erection pressing forward to fill it. Panic, a terrible excitement. And then the man's hand, a hand, wriggling into the gap, struggling into it. He felt the weight of seconds to be unbearable as the hand fought through the stiffness of the tweed, found the second opening in his drawers. And then it was in. The hand was closing round it. His eyes were closed by fear. The man's neck was slippery beneath his lips. The carriage rattled in its frame. The lights shot darts behind his eyelids. The hand closed round it. He felt each finger find its place, begin to pull the flesh tight to release, to guide it down into some sort of tenderness to draw it tight again. He could barely breathe. He felt stretched tight, stretched beyond endurance. His body ached up and down, up and down. Fingers spanned the length of him, pulled tight, pulled faster. His hands were suddenly free. He had them on the man's hips, was reaching up into the damp, damp warmth inside his jacket, feeling his ribs beneath his shirt, then down, fumbling with his buttons, cupping the swell of his cock. His hand was in the man's trousers, the cock warm in his hand. He rubbed the head with his thumb. It was happening so fast now, up and down, faster and faster, rising in him, through his fingertips, up to his neck, under his ears, at his temples, he was gasping. The man's neck was wet beneath his lips. It was like the pumping of blood from a split vein, a deep wound. He was woken by the violence of it, helplessly halfway. some very high-end smut. <laughs> you can all go home happy now. It really is. And <clears throat> what I was thinking, um, I mean, I've read that twice. I've read the whole book twice. But like, um, what I'm sort of hearing from you reading it out is um, that, you know, we're talking about the late 19th century. We're talking about a time before, like, <laughs> the internet. I mean, to be obvious about it. Um, but there's just so much, you pay so much kind of close attention to this kind of erotic scene. And it's the very opening of the book. Um, and what I love about this scene is that it sort of sets us up with this nexus of a dream, but then the reality of waking up in his marital bed, a little sticky. Um, 
but the dream has taken place in a public place. And what happens through the course of the book is John, this character, externalizing this inner life and having this very sort of public outing, if you like. Um, is that was that an intentional? Was that what the opening scene was supposed to do? Uh, it was certainly meant to gesture to obviously sexual frustration. Um, I knew. I knew I wanted to open with a wet dream. Um, maybe because there's not been enough wet dreams in literature. Certainly not as opening scenes. No. Um, because that seems so evocative of a type of sexual frustration that probably most men in the room feel in their kind of teenage years. And actually what John is going through is a kind of suppressed puberty or something. I remember when I came out, I felt like I was running my puberty all for the first time, that I'd been sort of denied puberty because I was so repressed um, that I'd never had that experience. I'd never felt overwhelming desire. I'd never been able to act on it. So in, in my weird imaginary, um, the wet dream sort of represents that. So I knew I, need, I wanted to start that way. And later it came to me that actually a nice way to get into that would be this scene on the tube. I had an idea that something like this scene might happen later in the in the book because I had a friend who told me a story at university which would now not pass any Me Too tests, um, which was that he was at a gig and someone was pressing behind him and and he thought it was fantastic. And not everyone would feel like that, but that's what that's how he felt. It's all about consent. And it's, it, well, not really in this case. Um, <laughs> but he had found it very sexy and it had stuck in my mind, this story, partly the minutiae of it, because it was at a gig and it was sustained over a long period of time. And I thought about the evolving motions and movements um, that you would experience. I mean, we've all had, I think, I hope, erotic moments in our lives which are built out of tiny, shifting movements. Um, so these two thoughts came together. What if, what if it's a, it's a dream? Um, what if we have this sustained thing? What if I try and experiment with length? Um, what if I try and sustain that over pages? And it's a bit of a risk because obviously the I wake up and it's a dream thing is a awful cliche. Um, but I hope it's redeemed by the wet aspect of the dream. <laughs> and um, yes, and then it becomes a it becomes a powerful metaphor for repression. And you're quite right. It's we start with this man dreaming in his marital bed, and through the novel, this man as you said very nicely in, in an email to me yesterday, you know, he, he's in a way kind of dreaming into being um, his lover, Frank, who comes along in a few chapters' time um, and dreaming into being that sexual life which is about to open for him. So, yes, it's a, it's a inside out. And the whole book, in a way, is an inside out. Mm. We move from the intimate, the personal, to the public in the second half of the novel. Mm, yeah, quite frighteningly. Um, I loved this book and um, it's been out here uh, in the UK for a week, um, in the US for two weeks. It's had a fantastic reception. How are you feeling? <laughs> um, uh, fantastic. Um, I said at my uh, book launch that I've actually been haunted by fears of death and destruction uh, in the run-up to this book being published. Um, it was obviously the best like speech I've ever heard at a book launch. <laughs> um, so I, I have been in a state of high anxiety that somehow I was going to ruin it for myself, and and it's been such a wonderful reception, and that that has made it worse <laughs> in a way. But I have now I'm now coming to a state of acceptance, and um, I feel like life will continue. Uh, I will not jump under a bus. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been great because the book has been uh, almost ten years in the making. I had the idea almost exactly ten years ago when I was still doing my PhD. Um, when I came across these characters, the real life figures, uh, and I knew I wanted to write a novel and 
suddenly it kind of crystallized around this moment in time. Do you remember what triggered that realization at that moment? Uh, well, I, the first thing I did was I discovered the figure of John Addington Simmons, who um, my character John is based on. And I came across him reading a biography of Oscar Wilde. And I was so struck by this other gay figure at the end of the 19th century who I felt, you know, as a 24-year-old that I was not familiar with, um, who I did not know. And what's, what appealed to me was his level of candour and um, self-consciousness about his position as a gay man living at the end of the 19th century married with four children um, and unlike Wilde he did have this articulacy about that situation. Wilde you can see it there it's disguised it's disguised in the in the novels and the plays and the essays um, but Simmons really wanted to do something about it. He talked about it with people he wrote about it he privately circulated books that he wrote on the subject saying homosexuality is normal and natural and it should not be a crime. And that was very striking to come across that voice um, at that time. Um, and he wrote a very moving autobiography, which he started in 1889 and wasn't published until 1984, and then only in part. It was locked away in the London Library. And that's a very moving human document where he sees his sexuality as at the core of his life, at the core of the meaning of his life. Um, and that's, that was fascinating too. So Andy had an active sex life and romance and relationships. So in this figure, there seemed to be something to work with, something novel, something interesting, something I felt like people didn't know about. Uh, and that was a kind of gay figure that I was interested in dis exploring, dramatising. Um, and the, the, the problem then was how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, looking at his biography and thinking, what's the shape here? What's the story? Where do I, if it were to be a novel, where would I take it? Um, and then... I remembered that he had written this book, started to write this book before he died, um, with this younger man, Havelock Ellis, who was a socialist and a radical thinker and a literary critic and all sorts of other things. But he was married to a lesbian, so he had a personal interest in homosexuality as well. And these two men had come together and written this book together, started to write this book together, arguing that homosexuality should not be a crime. And they had done it without ever meeting. They'd never met. Simmons had eventually died. And they'd never confessed to each other why they were interested in writing the book. Simmons never said, I'm a gay man. Ellis never said, I'm married to a lesbian. They both contributed personal studies to the book. Um, Simmons contributed his personal case study to the book they were writing, describing his sense of himself, sense of his life. And... Ellis contributed his wife's case study to the book. And they both did this again anonymously without saying that's what they were doing. And there was something so interesting in that human detail and the mirroring of the relationships, gay man, straight wife, straight man, gay wife. That when I saw that, saw the book, that's when I thought, that's my novel, that's, that's my way in, that's how I dramatise this moment that I'm interested in because I was also by then, that point interested in why we didn't remember the optimism about what we would now call gay rights that this book represented, sexual inversion. Why didn't we remember it? Because the Oscar Wilde trial came along and smashed the whole thing up. So telling this story allowed me to kind of dramatise that hinge moment that we, I felt like we didn't remember. That's amazing. Um, so... The way the book is structured, um, you've got um, two sort of narratives happening side by side. 
one following um, John Addington, as he's called in the book, um, loosely based on John, John Addington Simmons, and, and Henry Ellis, who's loosely based on Havelock Ellis. Um, at the beginning, as we've heard, uh, John um, is kind of coming to the, towards the end of his marriage or coming towards a point of being honest with himself about the sham, I guess, of his marriage. Um, and Henry's narrative begins with him getting married in a registry office. And it's really funny because, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a small wedding with only two guests, um, two witnesses. And then they go off to have tea somewhere. And then the bride and groom say, all right, well, I'll see you tomorrow then. And literally go their separate ways and end up living apart in a very loving, very sort of mutually supportive, but sexless marriage. Um, and so you get these sort of two narratives going side by side and the subject of the book comes up and eventually sort of brings them together. They don't meet straight away uh, until there's like this amazing moment where the fog descends over London and all of the sort of narratives kind of seem to, to coagulate. I mean, what was your, I mean, what can you talk about in terms of like your narrative structure and how you approach structuring the book? Um, well, I think I, at the beginning, well, maybe I should say that the book, um, very significantly departs from the facts. So my book begins in 1894 with a, with a Addington Simmons style figure and a Havelock Ellis style figure. But in reality, Simmons had died in 1893. So I'm immediately kind of shifting us out of the historical narrative in order to kind of run a counterfactual. Um, what would have happened if Simmons, who, as I said, had a kind of proto-gay rights position, was becoming increasingly forthright um, and worrying his friends and family, what would he have done if faced by the wild trial? You know, if he had been around and that book had been taken forward, what would have happened? So... So right from the beginning, I knew I was leaving a lot of the facts behind, but I took a while to work out um, where fact and fiction, how they sat together. And one of the things was this fact that the two men had never met in real life. Um, so that helped, stru initially that helped structure the, the plot, the, the structure of the book, that these two men were not meeting. And actually that became very helpful because it's, it created these two contrasting narratives, allowed you to build two characters that were eventually going to come together in this kind of bold enterprise to to write this bold book, but that they were coming from very different places and that they, both intellectually and personally in terms of their relationships, their marriages. Um, so I I liked that. I liked that I had that sense of separation and then I could bring them together again because it becomes very important when they do come together. It's important that they've actually come from different places. Um, John has a very personal interest in the question, the issue of homosexuality, whereas Henry has a very, he would say, very scientific. You know, yes, he's got a, his wife, Edith, but he's interested in sex as a kind of intellectual question. And the fact that they come at the the book and the issue of homosexuality from those separate directions becomes very relevant as the book progresses. Um, yeah. It's interesting that he almost has to justify himself in terms of his interest in sex by sort of saying that he has a peculiarity, um, Henry. Um... Well, he's not very open about that. He's keeping that to himself. But um, yes, there's a... There's, 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 two, there's three things going on. Henry has an intellectual interest in sex and a kind of utopian belief that um, if we know more about sex, if the public knows more about sex, understands sex and their sexual lives, it will help people leave, live freer and happier lives. Um, he also has his wife, Edith, who is a lesbian, and he also has a sexual kink of his own. Um, which means, which is that he likes to, or he is aroused by the sight of a woman urinating. 
which is true. This is the the historical figure Havelock Ellis um, had this kink fetish um, desire. So Henry knows what it is to have a stigmatized sexual desire. So that becomes very relevant too. That's that gives him another. There's another level, another layer um, that underlines his engagement with the subject. Um, and of course, he's actually, despite everything, he finds it very hard to talk about. And actually, as is perhaps still the case now, it's actually harder to talk about that sexual desire than it is to talk about homosexuality, which, as my characters, you know, would uh, love to say, has a lineage, has a cultural lineage, has a history that can be drawn on and and, you know... I still don't think we have a lineage for a for a piss fetish. Um, so, so it, actually, it's harder for for him to talk about than uh, than some other subjects. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the way this book, um, even though it's kind of based on um, an actual book that exists. Well, the, your book isn't based on it, but it sort of tells the story of its writing and publication. Uh, sexual inversion. Um, the wild child is something that has dominated discourse or queer discourse pertaining to that period, but it's something that's happening in the background. Um, and even when you delineate some of the words and phrases, some of the statements that are coming from um, from the, the barrister stand during the wild child, they're sort of mixed up with John's own sort of thoughts, like guilty thoughts, I suppose, that, that are going through his mind. Um, so the, the wild child is kind of in the background, but it's not sort of centered in the narrative. But what you do have is, uh, what you do center is the, the idealism of the time, of the new life, which perhaps, I don't know if you can define the new life, but also um, talk about um, the influence of Edward Carpenter, who um, is a character in the novel, uh, and also the poetry of Walt Whitman that sort of finds its way in as well. Yes, so... Yeah, so as I said earlier, one of the things I really was struck by all these years ago was the fact that Wilde is the dominant figure, that we... When we think of the 1890s, we think of gay lives in Victorian Britain we think of Oscar Wilde and he frames our whole sense of that period and that moment. And, it, you know, it's tragic. It's a tragic case and a tragic downfall and a, um, an incredible story. But it does mean that we lose sight of what was happening just before that moment. Um, so in the book, the I don't think it's a spoiler to say that the Wilde trial sort of comes from nowhere because I wanted to dramatise exactly that sense that there's, it's an eruption into people's lives and that there were gay men and other kinds of people who were imagining a very different future, a new life, that um, Wilde's trial, which was kind of self-inflicted, um, blew up. So that moment, which someone like the figure of Edward Carpenter helps represent... Um, is about um, is very closely connected to the poetry of Walt Whitman, which is which. So, if if people were part of what was happening was that people like Simmons, the historical figure, were recovering the sense that the ancient Greek practice of homosexuality um, needed to be identified rather than being kind of passed over or obfuscated about or. Um, you know, or thrown into the shadows. It needed to be, or kind of explained away as euphemism, or you know, Plato's. And he doesn't really mean what he, th what you think he's saying. He doesn't really mean that. There was a lot of that going on. So part of it is about reclaiming the that Greek heritage, that sense that there was a time when what is now stigmatized and punished was a legitimate, socially acceptable, and in fact honoured um, practice. So that's one thing that's happening. But on the other hand, the poetry of Walt Whitman seems to offer a kind of modern example of a homosexuality which can find legitimacy and social purpose and honour in the present. Um, it's about comradeship, it's about democracy, it's about these kind of cross-class 
relationships that help obliterate social distinctions that put you in, in harmony with nature and the body. So that's kind of the intellectual moment that's happening here. And it ties in with um, aestheticism, you know, kind of Walter Pater, you know, live for the moment, all this kind of stuff that was working to undermine existing moral codes. Um, and Carpenter, who is, a, in fact, the only figure who sort of plays himself in the book, is the kind of only real-life historical figure that appears as himself. Um, he represents that kind of conjunction of interests. He's a socialist, he's a Whitmanite, he's a poet, he's a sandal maker, a vegetarian, a nudist sunbather. Um, he's a countercultural figure, um, and he offers a model. There's lots of different kinds of gay lives in the book, because one of the things I wanted to show was that, you know, you don't just have Oscar Wilde over here. You don't have the sad man in his room. Uh, you have people getting on and trying to live the best they can, and there's different ways of doing that. And Carpenter is one of the most dramatic ways, because he lives in his house with his boyfriend, George, and they're fairly open... He's friends with the local priest. He's a very public figure. Uh, he speaks, he writes. When he dies in 1929, the prime minister and members of the cabinet pay tribute to him. And he does all that whilst being a kind of semi-open gay man. Um, and that, and, and in fact, there's another great thing, which is that Forster, E.M. Forster, visits uh, Carpenter and, and Merrill's, George Merrill's house in uh, you know the 1910s, and George Merrill pats him on the bum, which, as Forster says, I believe he did often. Um, and Forster says the, it, the the contact went up through the small of my back and into my ideas. And he, the book Morris came out of this moment. So this is a very long answer to the question. Um, You've got plenty of time. This is. Uh, this is the kind of intellectual moment, the utopian um, thinking about homosexuality, the, the optimism that something can be done, something can change, um, that is derailed by the Oscar Wilde trial. Um, and Carpenter represents one kind of axis over here, someone like my John Addington character or someone else over here, Ellis over here, but all these figures are, are linked by that interest, by an interest in socialism, feminism. It's all about um, thinking about new ways of living, of experiencing life better. And I hope the book shows, shows that. It certainly does. And there are also characters who remain closeted, um, it's interesting you mentioned mirroring earlier, because I literally wrote that down earlier, um, that both John and Henry have best friends and confidants who um, discourage them um, quite passionately against writing this book, uh, against writing this, uh, this book together, against the collaboration. Um, one of whom remains resolutely closeted and doesn't act upon his desires at all. Uh, the other of whom skedaddles off to France um, when the trial of Oscar Wilde begins. Um, I just thought that was very interesting in terms of the mirroring. But I also wanted to talk to you about um, the language of the book because, and it's interesting you mentioned Forster because um, I was having a conversation with someone the other day who about your book and... Uh, they said it was the sort of book that Forster would have written if he'd been allowed to, which I don't know how you feel about that as a... Rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it does feel as if it's kind of, um, yeah, written in that time. Like it feels strikingly sort of accurate for the late 19th century um, without sort of being sort of overburdened with the need to represent itself as historical fiction, it still feels fresh. Um, is that your usual fiction writing style or is that something that's specific to this material? Um, well, when, you, when it's your first novel and it's a novel you've been writing for a really long time, it's hard to tell now what's my real, what's my real style. I think this is my, I think this is how 
I write. I did things like um, I was quite careful. To, the book is going to be full of errors and anachronisms, um, I'm sure. But I I tried very hard to not use a word or a concept that would seem alien to the time. That that was one of my rules. Um, but I don't know if I I don't know if I intended to write in a kind of artificially or his, historicized way. I think, um, in general, in fact, one of my colleagues said to me quite recently, she said, you talk like a Victorian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she meant that she, as a compliment. She, I think she did. Where is she? Um, <laughs> and she said, there she is. Um, and uh, all I said was, can you pass the salt? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I, so I think I actually have a um i just think people are missing a trick i'm not i think there are so many um this is probably going to be the wrong word locutions or that so many ways of structuring a sentence so many um um sort of there are so many tick writerly ticks that were common in the 19th century or the early 20th century or the 50s or whatever each period has them that get kind of paired away in the kind of push for a modern prose. And actually, it just means we just lose a more interesting language, prose. You know, there are just so many interesting ways to write a sentence. Um, and if they all get written off as fusty or mannered, then we just, we just, it's just a cultural loss. So whether it's because, as I embarrassingly admitted in a newspaper, Thing the other day that I just never read any new fiction um, and never rarely read anything published before about 1912. Um, I find it very natural to, to adapt these these rhythms and structure sentence structures um, that maybe to others look as though they're kind of purposely um, trying to evoke a period. I, I don't think that's true. I think I really do write like that, and I think I I'm interested in stylists you know dickens james bowen uh sybil bedford vs pritchett um writers who like doing something odd with their sentences like a jerkiness a an unexpected bit of syntax an unexpected image um that inter that interests me you know Actually, I now think I'm writing a book that's maybe a bit plainer in style, but um, that felt very natural to me at the time. I didn't feel like I was doing something deliberately to capture a period effect. I mean, it's beautifully, um, uh, you know, it observes London beautifully, London of that time. Um, and I mean, I did get the dictionary out quite a few times while I was reading this book, um, but also like Google Maps to see if the buildings that um, that they lived in, one in Gloucester Square, one uh, in Brixton, what's, what's the address in Brixton again? Dover Mansions. Dover Mansions. They're which both is still, still there. Which is still there. Yeah. yeah, no blue plaques though. No, Ellis does have a blue plaque. Oh, does he? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, it just really sort of beautifully captures uh, the the sights, sounds, uh, the trains, the weather, the climate. It was um, when the novel opens in 1894, I think it was like the last winter of what they call the Little Ice Age. Um, ten consecutive... It's news to me. <laughs> <laughs> from reading around the subject. Um uh, yeah, like 10 consecutive ice cold winters where the temperature really got. I mean, but I start with like a that. boiling hot summer. That's my first anachronism. Yeah. No, no, no. Like, that's wonderful. But the winter that oh, yes, follows. The it. winter that follows. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yes. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so yes. Um, I'm just interested in um, the kind of the queer history that you sort of touch. I'm not sure if it's deliberate even. Um, so like the first date that um, John and Frank go on is at the King of Prussia, uh, a pub called the King of Prussia, which is a real pub, but I just thought it was great because the King of Prussia was a gay man. <laughs> well, that, well, so, <laughs> Frederick the well, Great. Well, uh, well, yes, that's true, that's true. <laughs> no, I didn't think of that. Um, 
I what's what's nice is people say it's a very good it's a London book. Yeah. But I didn't really mean it to be uh, in the same way that I didn't mean to write like that, really. And I didn't mean to... I wasn't aware that I was doing so much weather and light. Apart from this, apart from I'm the sort of person who's interested in weather and light. And I used to do a lot of... Um, I make a lot of notes in my phone. And, and I did a lot of walking to work and walking around these areas. So I used to just look at things and make notes and try and describe the sky and describe the leaves and you know I've got acres of terrible stuff about what the sea looked like on uh, 19th of June 2016 um, and so that sort of thing was just that just seemed very natural to me what's actually quite embarrassing is that if it's a London book it's a London book which is weirdly concentrated in the area where I work um, because I have a very poor sense of spatial awareness and I can't read maps. Um, so it was much easier to just, <laughs> just have my characters walking around places I knew. So it's a very, it's a very Bloomsbury and Hoban book, which actually turns out to be also historically okay because um, Bloomsbury and Hoban were places where radical... Um, thinkers and literary people hung out. So it was all okay. But that's really, um, as a novelist all the time, you're trying to exploit your weaknesses. You're simultaneously trying to exploit them and hide them, mm. which might be the same thing. Um, you always, I always used to picture the reader as a kind of horse that I was just lead, <laughs> leading with its blinkers on. And I just don't, don't look there, don't look there, just look over here. Um, so yes, you're always, you're always doing things like that. So you don't often, my characters, I don't often describe their journeys. They just turn up in places. And that's my way of getting around my spatial problem. Mm, well, yeah, it works. Um, so we're going to um, open up to our audience questions in about five minutes. Um, there'll also be some um, probably online because we're all being watched. Um, so, yeah, if you have any questions, please uh, prepare them. Um I just want to talk a little bit about um, it's it, you know, it's hard to talk about a book that's just come out that not everyone I don't know if anyone's read it yet but um, I don't want to give away any spoilers <laughs> um, but I kind of want to talk about um, how I felt about John in particular uh, and Frank as well that they become sort of less likable as the book goes on. Um, they sort of, John in particular, becomes very sort of self-absorbed, very kind of um, wedded to his idealism. And there's a lot of kind of collateral damage. Um, can you talk a bit about like how you negotiated that? Were there any challenges in terms of, because this is obviously sort of someone who's based on a real person loosely. Um, but, you know, what were the challenges in terms of... Um, I guess, you know, the reader could be lost. I mean, they're not because of the narrative quality, but um, yeah, what was it like to to write a character that becomes less likable? Um, well, I'm glad he does. I think one of the big challenges um, that I, I hope I, I hope I succeeded in, in, a, in avoiding the sense of... Um, of giving people what they want. You know, this is a, it's very easy to sympathize objectively with a closeted gay man living in the 1890s. Um, it's very easy to feel sorry for him and sympathize with his position. So if this wasn't going to be a kind of feel good um, movement, through history, where we all pat ourselves on the back and say, "Oh, what a you know how terrible," um, then he had to be. I mean, you want your characters to be complex anyway, but this character in particular, because his story was so readily comprehensible, whereas Henry's relationship with his wife Edith and her lover Angelica is a kind of more complicated and, in a way, nuanced setup with more sh kind of shifting power balance. Um, John's story is more comprehensible. It's a gay man wanting to break out the closet in 1894. Um, so 
I just wanted to just push back against it. I wanted I wanted to create a discomfort in readers where they would feel angry with him or um, sick of him, fed up of him, or, or even find themselves saying, you know, John, get back, get back in the closet. <laughs> just suck it up. <laughs> um, so I want, yeah, I wanted readers to have that, uh, you know, squirmishness. Why do I actually want him to go back in the closet? Because if they didn't have that, we wouldn't understand the society. We wouldn't understand, we wouldn't feel the power, the vice-like grip of the society, which um, turns people in on themselves, but also turns them outwards on other people. So John, John's bid for honesty and openness and happiness comes at the cost of his wife's happiness in mm. particular. Um, yeah, I mean, she's kind of the centre of the book, in a way, yeah. for me, um, because of her extraordinary ability to allow what happens in her household to happen as long as it doesn't leave the household, um, but also her decision to walk away if when things get a bit too, I don't know, Fruity. uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the figure of Catherine, she, she's crucial to the novel because she does at a certain point, kind of turn the mirror back yeah. at John and at the reader, because, you know, if the reader has been on his side all up to now, suddenly the reader is confronted with the effects of his behaviour and the way in which he has damaged her and... And, um, and he's... He's in a kind of impossible position... And a reviewer said the other day, you know, it's a kind of character with a tragic flaw, or a Greek, you know, it's sort of a Greek tragedy sort of thing. And I did think of it as a as a, a tragedy, a kind of mundane human Victorian tragedy, where there is just no easy answer. This man can't be himself without damaging other people. He can't do that because the society won't let him. And therefore it becomes a novel about the society. So it's not really meant to be just about those individuals. It's meant to um, bring out that that whole culture. And you couldn't do that without saying that the culture twists people, it makes them do bad things, and that's and it hurts women as much as it hurts men. And And John knows that, and it still doesn't get him anywhere. He knows that it hurts his wife. He knows that... Um, Criminalizing homosexuality hurts women. But in order to say that, to make that case, to try and change the law, change society, he has to hurt the women in his life. Um, so it's a kind of impossible situation. Sure is. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, I have a microphone here if someone's got one. Otherwise, there is one from there is a man over here. the cyber world. There's a man so over, here, one over here. Um, thank you both for a fascinating conversation. Um, I have read the book. I think it's a real triumph. Uh, I've got a question, if you don't mind, about process. And, and, and Tom, you have a background as a, in, in academic study of this period. Now, I'm curious about what... In your own knowledge and expertise in the period was was helpful, and and what in terms of approach to the time and the sources, you kind of had to disregard in in, in taking your story somewhere, as you say, a kind of counterfactual mm -hmm. version of some of a world that in some senses is very familiar, and in others is is sort of thrillingly different and new and and and, and offering a possibility that that history doesn't. So did it was there a kind of war, a kind of intellectual creative? conflict there for you as a writer? Um, uh, well, I think the, f the, I think the biggest thing that having an academic background studying the late 19th century, I, I did politics, I didn't do any of this um, stuff, it was much boring, much more boring than that. Um, I think the thing it gave me was a complete immersion in, it might be another reason I speak like a Victorian, I had a, a complete immersion in 19th century 
prose. I just read thousands and thousands and thousands of Victorian newspaper articles from the 1880s and 1890s. And maybe that's relevant too, because I had this kind of very big net that I was sweeping through the sources. Um, so it meant I read all sorts of irrelevant stuff in order to find the thing I wanted to find. So I was constantly kind of unconsciously collecting um, data about what late 19th century streets looked like, buildings, um, crowds, uh you know, that sort of thing. So when it came to write the novel, and I, would, I had read an awful lot of 19th century fiction. So when it came to writing the novel, I felt somehow that I was mentally in the late 19th century, that I'd been living in the 1890s for a while already, um, which I think was very helpful. When it comes to, I mean, I'm sure it helped to be able to, you know, having researched in the past and that, you know, I could sort of chew my way through books and that was all very good. But I think it was more... And I do think being a, a historian is interested in motive. I do think historians and and uh, novelists have lots in common. They're interested in motive. They're interested in complicating a picture. They don't like simplistic narratives. You're always saying, yeah, but what about this? Or what did so-and-so think over here? Or actually, if we looked from this angle. So there's a lot of similarities there between how a historian and a novelist would look at a human situation. Um so that's all very helpful. When it came to just writing the story, I think I say at the back of the book, you know, I just, I had the kind of reckless iconoclasm of, yeah. of an ex-historian. Um, I think having been bound to facts so long, um, I was just completely ruthless. The, the, book, ex the book has all sorts of, of real life historical material in it. Um, that I scissored up and, and pasted in and changed the wording and, um, so, I mean, I'm sure some people think that's a terrible crime, but I felt like I was serving a, a good historical purpose because what I was doing was a kind of counterfactual. Um, but also I felt like I was trying to convey to readers what had struck me about that moment in time. And the best way to do that, to bring out the issues that had leapt out at me was to give up the facts. It was necessary to tell the truths I thought needed telling to give up the facts. So I felt kind of no shame about it at all. Uh, someone might make me feel some more shame. Um, can I give you two from cyberspace, which I think are related? From Despina, did you feel at any time you were demonstrating your vulnerability at all when writing the book? considering the still overwhelming attitude to queer lives. And one from Aidan Varney, which um, we just do message one is one of my favourite books. So it goes, we were at all influenced by Eve Kostrovsky's Sedgwick's Epistemology of the Closet. I suspect she would have loved your novel. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I hope she would. And I would feel very embarrassed that I've never read her book. <laughs> um, so that's an easy answer to that question. Though I, I, I have, I have read references to to uh, to her work. Um, I didn't feel like I was. Um, what was the first part of the question? Um, vulnerabilities. Did you, feel yes. you were demonstrating your vulnerability. Yes. Well. I mean, you feel the vulnerability when you write a book with this many sex scenes and give it to your grandmother. <laughs> um, so, yes, you're putting a lot... Especially, actually, at the beginning, I remember feeling... Um, you know, I'd, I'd got this uh, literary agent who had actually found me through my... It was actually me writing about local government and austerity that um, she'd got in touch with me. And I'd said, actually, I really want to write this novel. So you definitely do that. Then she said, OK, send me a few chapters. And, you know, I wrote that first chapter. And that's that's vulnerable because any writer feels like, you you know, you write from knowledge. So not that I've ever shagged on the tube, but... Um, you haven't? <laughs> no. um, yeah, any any writer exposes themselves, perhaps especially in a when writing sex scenes, maybe. Um, but vulnerable, um, 
No, I don't think I. I don't think so. You feel vulnerable again, just to, as a write, All writers feel vulnerable because you've spent a long time sat on your own writing something, and you, and you hope it's good. But um, what's been very striking? I, I've got a very naughty addiction to looking at my Goodreads reviews. No, and I know. I know. It's, ter- it's terrible. It doesn't make me feel good. Um, no, 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 no. no. Uh, but what's amazing is still the amount of people who say, I had to give up reading this because of the sex scenes. I couldn't, oh my God, that first chapter, absolutely no, you know, one star, too much. And that's amazing how many of those there are. So I do feel like, you know, here's my characters in the 1890s fighting for openness and it's still a battle that uh, needs to be fought. Yeah. I feel like Goodreads is a game station for like homophobes and racists to just literally give one star to everything that doesn't fit their conservative attitudes. Um, there was another question uh, towards the back in the room, I believe. Uh, I saw another hand. hand again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tom. I would like to ask about how you went about the editorial process. How does one even choose who is going to edit your books and being editor yourself? I'd like to know how you received comments and suggestions (laughs) and how you arrived at the final version. Um, Yeah, Tom, how do you edit? (laughs) He's my editor at the LRB. (laughs) Um... Well, that's a good question. Um, how did I... T- well, luckily, um, and I hope it doesn't sound too self-commending, uh, the edits weren't too um, significant on a kind of sentence level um, when the book w- was submitted. There were some ideas about characters and situations, but it was um, there wasn't too much of that. I did get very upset with the... I hope she's not here. The uh, copy editor who took out or inser- either took out or inserted, mainly inserted commas, a huge number of commas, um, which are very hard to see on track changes. So um, because, because I, I don't know, do you need to know my theory of commas? Probably not. Um, so I did find that very, I found that difficult. Um but I do think being an editor, um, maybe some of my colleagues would disagree. Maybe they went through the book with a blue pencil. But I do think being an editor made me a, has made me a better writer anyway. I think you you have a sort of process going on even before you write that sentence, or you look at it straight away and think, you know, how would I how would I change that? Um, it certainly makes you more, or felt like it made me more ruthless that I could just cut things out you know I took I took out 30,000 words out of the book in the week that it was bought by publishers so just when everyone was saying it was great and yes please I went back to it and just took out loads and loads and loads of stuff so I and I don't know if I could have done that had I not done it for a day job maybe when do you start showing people at what stage do you start showing friends and first readers? When the book was submitted to publishers, it had only been read by two people. So it had been read by my boyfriend and by my agent. So so not many people. And I think, I don't know if you, if you feel the same, There's, there, you have to reach a point where you feel comfortable with... I have to feel like it's pretty good and pretty solid before I let anyone near it because... Otherwise, my confidence will be shattered. Um, particularly if you know you, there's still things you need to work out. That's the thing. You don't want someone saying, oh, well, well this character's rubbish, or what about this? When you know you've got the architecture in your head and that will justify all that. You, you don't want someone to have that inferior reading experience, or I don't, maybe because I'm too proud. Um, maybe I'm it's how opposite. proud you are. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm a flasher, like <laughs> an exhibitionist. Um, no, yeah, yeah. No. Yes, another question. We're ready. 
You spoke interestingly about cultural heritage earlier, so I wondered, Ian Forster's Morris, is it source of inspiration or is it something that haunts you, the inevitability of comparisons that you'll always get asked about Morris? Uh, yeah, so Forster's, Forster's Morris is a um, is interesting because as a historical document, because it is a product of the kind of thinking that I'm analysing in the book. So Forster, as I said, was friends with Carpenter. He wrote in his diaries or commonplace book that um, Simmons was, he felt closer to Simmons, the figure of Simmons, than to anyone else. Um, he was one of the first people to read Simmons's memoir in full when it was locked up in the London Library and he got access because he was on the board or something and he sat there and read the whole thing through and wrote this kind of very copied chunks of it out and and um, and wrote a sad thing saying, will anyone, will, you know, will anyone remember this in 1984? Will, you know, will anyone, will anyone look? Will anyone care? You know, Simmons gave his whole life to this, he says at the end. So he's a figure who comes out of this tradition completely. And so Morris is that kind of Whitmanite, Carpenterite vision of, um, or concludes with that vision of homosexuality as it ends with a cross-class uh, relationship, an escape into kind of Arcadia, um, and what I wanted to do, it was on my mind when I started to write the book, um, because because of those things, because it was an expression of that cultural moment, I wanted to complicate it. I wanted to show how it wasn't that easy just to run off with your with the gardener, that actually there was a lot of dubiousness in the attraction middle class, upper middle class men felt for working class men. And yes, you could idealise it uh, with reference to Whitman and, and so on, but actually there were some dodgy power dynamics there. And it wasn't going to ever be that easy for a middle class man to go out with a working class man. So I had Morris on my mind right from the very beginning because I wanted to kind of tell a reverse Morris or a Morris with all that idealism stripped out. Um, to explore the moment that Morris came out of and expose the limitations of that um, philosophy and idealism. So um, I'm very touched when people invoke Forster, but I, apart from that, he wasn't really on my mind at all in terms of structuring or writing the novel, but I think we're all in his in his debt, in his working, in his tradition, so perhaps it's just inevitable. Should we have this uh, one more question after this, perhaps? Yeah. Thank you. Um, you talk about the book being uh, counterfactual and the effect that the Wild trial had when it came along and the kind of impact it had. Um, and so I guess I wonder if you think that the new life, as it was discussed and envisaged at the time, really was possible and what that might have looked like, what that queer history of the 20th century could have been without the wild trial? Um, I think a really important context for all this, and it, it's kind of discussed in the book, is that these people, when they were thinking about Britain and the British law, they, they knew that it was um, if not unique, it was um, particular. And for example, so my book starts in 1894, but in 1889, Italy had legalised homosexuality. And homosexuality was already legal in France uh, and in other countries in Europe. So it wasn't, it wasn't pure utopianism. It wasn't pure idealism. There was a sense that if they can do it there, why can't we do it here? Why is the British law so severe? And it was more severe even in countries where they did have um, laws in operation against homosexuality. The British law was incredibly severe with this, you know, hard labour sentence. Still, a, I think they still officially had a death penalty for sodomy or, um, or at least a life sentence. Um, so 
there was a kind of practical, realistic aspect to this that why why can't we really you know why why can't rationality triumph? Why can't we present the arguments and maybe people will listen? And you know it was a liberal culture where rational debate and the kind of fruits of rational debate were respected. And so these people, Simmons, Ellis, Carpenter, saw themselves as working within that tradition. You bring the facts, you bring the arguments, start the conversation, and surely reason will prevail. Do I think they were right to think that? Would it have happened with, without Wilde? And I do think it's always important to remember that Wilde really brought this case on himself, that he didn't need to sue uh, Queensbury, Douglas's father, because Queensbury, though he was pretty mad, just said, said the truth, said that Wilde was gay and he was gay, and Wilde said, I'm not, and sat next to Alfred Douglas with his lawyer and said, it's a lie, I'm taking this man to court. So he authored his own downfall. So if he hadn't have done that, and bearing in mind he was leading a pretty flagrant life beforehand and getting away with it, um, and there's Carpenter with his boyfriend, there's Simmons going round with his Venetian gondolier. Um, everyone had a gondolier at that time. Um, could they? Could they have? Could they have changed the law? Could they have done that? Mm, I guess we just. I guess. I guess the easy answer is to say we just don't know. Um, I think maybe they could. Maybe it could have. Bec it could have become part of those conversations as it already was about women's rights, um, and you know it was already tied in with socialism through Whitman and Carpenter. And um, could it? Could the sting have been taken out of it? Could have. You know, Forster said in the sixties. Um, you know, if if the law could just if homosexuality homosexuality could be legalized overnight without a debate, we could do it. People don't care enough. People don't aren't that worried about it. It's the real problem is having the public debate, um, and I think that would have been the problem. I mean, Bernard Shaw says around in the eighteen nineties. You know the law being the the fear of being thought to be gay prevents men saying in public what they say in private, and again, what's kind of interesting is that what he says men are saying in private is it's fine. We all know someone a bit like that. It's not a you know whatever, and the issue is then who dares come forward, and that's a bit of a problem in the book because Henry is constantly arguing with people who think he must be gay, including his wife, because he's writing this book. And that went on. For, I mean, Graham Robb, the historian of France, wrote a book about homosexuality in the late 90s. And he says in the afterword, you know, I had an absolute nightmare writing this book because everyone assumed I was gay and asked, you know, and couldn't believe I was doing this as a straight man and kept asking, you know, what's happened to your wife and, you know, what do your children think? And so that's, a, that's still happening at the end of the 1990s. So in the 1890s, the fear of putting your head above the parapet and making that argument um, must have been very powerful indeed. So this is a very long answer saying I don't know, basically. <laughs> probably not. I think it was probably going to be very, very hard. Politically, if the politics had been different, but I think the politics in the early 1900s are so tumultuous and so dominated by big causes, Ireland, tariff reform, uh, House of Lords... I'm not sure anyone had the energy to start this debate that no one wanted to have. Don't get me started on colonialism. <laughs> um, I think that's all we've got time for. Um, and all that remains for me to do is to thank you um, and invite the audience to do the same. Uh, the New Life by Tom Crew, lots of copies for, uh, for you all to buy, and I'm sure you'll be signing a few as well. Um, so thank you so much and congratulations on this incredible book. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you.